Hello and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host Rob. In today's video we're going to be doing another multi-class combination video and this one was kind of inspired by my fighter tier list video I just did recently for multi-classing. One of the builds I talked about was the idea of Battlemaster Fighter combined with Rogue. And today we're specifically going to look at Swashbuckler. Now to be honest I did do a similar video combining Fighter and Rogue in a melee focused build like this one but we looked at a bunch of fighters in general and we looked at a bunch of rogues in general. I didn't really like pick a specific subclass for each. And as a result, I didn't really go as in depth as I want to go in this video. So we're going to be going Battlemaster, like I said, and Swashbuckler. So why Battlemaster? Well, mostly because of maneuvers, honestly. Um, there's two maneuvers specifically that we want to take. One is Repost and one is Brace. And both of these give us an opportunity to make attacks on someone else's turn. And one of the big problems that rogues usually have is you only have the one attack per round usually. And even if you have a second attack, you still only have one sneak attack available. So you do a lot of damage per hit, but you're not hitting that often. You have only one attack. And even if you get a second attack, you only have the one sneak attack, which is where the bulk of your damage is coming from. So by getting the ability to attack on someone else's turn, other than ours, we're able to sneak attack again suddenly. And by combining it with Battlemaster Fighter, we have a couple maneuvers that pretty consistently allow us to be able to have that opportunity to sneak attack on someone else's turn. So that's why we took the Battlemaster. As far as Swashbuckler, I do think this one's more up in the air. If you really want to spell you can take Arcane Trickster. Or if you want to go Scout, Scout's a good choice. There's a bunch of, of decent opportunities here. But, like I said, I already made a general video covering a bunch of them. And the reason I like Swashbuckler mostly comes down to their level 3 ability, Rakish Audacity, which does two things. Number one, it adds our Charisma bonus to our initiative, which is nice, you know, nothing wrong with that, right? Going first is better than going last, usually. Or at least going early, better than going late, generally, you know. But more importantly, it allows us to sneak attack an enemy, even if we don't have an ally within five feet. And usually, that's a big limiting factor. Especially if you have a really high initiative, because you maxed your dexterity, and now you've got a decent charisma bonus getting added on on top of that. And maybe you took, like, the alert feat, for example. And, uh, you know, now you're going really fast, and then you realize the only other frontline guy who's trying to get in melee with you is the paladin, who's wearing heavy armor, and decided to dump dexterity because he doesn't need it if he's wearing heavy armor. And then you got a bunch of ranged guys, and they're not within five feet if, if they can help it, at least. Not if things are going good, anyway. And uh, so suddenly you're like, oh, too bad I've got like a plus 12 or 13 to my initiative bonus. Uh... Guess I'm holding my action again. <laughs> um, that can be kind of annoying sometimes. Besides, this is a cool trick we can do with holding our action, which is not my original idea. I stole this from, I think, Flute Snoot. <laughs> but you could, for example, attack, get a new sneak attack, action surge, and then hold your action, allowing you to attack on someone else's turn and then sneak attack again. When, since we're all about getting an extra sneak attacks in this build, I thought that was definitely worth mentioning. That was a great idea. Usually, rogues don't benefit that much from action surge compared to other classes, you know? Casters could cast two level spells in a round. Fighters could have three or potentially even four attacks around if they're at level 20. Then the action surge, you get all those attacks all over again, you know? Uh, that is awesome. Whereas rogue, because you only have the one sneak attack, it's like, oh, I get to stab them a couple more times for pretty low damage. But now, you could attack on someone else's turn by holding your action. I like that. So that's the main thing we're looking at from Swashbuckler. But of course, we're going to go a little more in-depth. So let's take a look at Battlemaster in general, and just Fighter in general, right? Level 1, we're going to get our second wind. We're going to get a fighting style. Uh, in my other video, which I called The Duelist, I think we want two weapon fighting, or maybe we want duelist. I can't remember even anymore. Both of those are decent choices, but I want to mention the defensive fighting style in this video. 
You could use a shield and a defense fighting style, which of course only requires that you wear armor. It doesn't have to be heavy armor or medium armor. Light armor works as well. And that's just going to give you another plus one of your armor class. And then potentially having a shield on top of that. One thing about repost is it only triggers if, it, if someone attacks us and misses. So we kind of want people to be attacking us, but we also kind of want a high armor class so we're not getting hit all the time. Because if they're hitting us, we still can't repost, you know? Um, so I actually don't mind that idea at all. Yeah, we're not going to do quite as much damage as we would as the other team, but we're going to be a little stronger defensively, and we're going to be able to, you know, potentially repost more often. Granted, we're still going to be capped by our superiority die. Keep that in mind, right? Um, so anyways, I thought I'd just mention those three as the three fighting styles I prefer for this one. Archery is my favorite, of course, but we're not making archers, so that's not going to do you any good. Level two, action surge. Uh, we've already mentioned action surge. No further need to go into it. Level three, we get our battle master abilities. Mainly, we're going to get combat superiority. It's going to give us four die eight, which basically just add to the damage on most of the abilities we want to use. Uh, it will improve by another die eight at seven if we go that high. But I'm really liking the idea of just three or five levels of Battle Master. I think that's really the good cutoffs. If you want extra attack, five. If you don't feel like you need it, three. <laughs> um, either one works honestly. It works quite well. Uh, we're also going to get our three maneuvers. Now, if we go to seven, as I mentioned, we'll get two more maneuvers on top of this. But really, I think three is probably going to be good. Um, so... We already mentioned repost. I think repost is almost required at this point. We're also going to be able to take Brace. This is one of the newer ones from Tasha's. I mean, Tasha has been out for a while now, so I'm sure people know what it is. But just in case you don't, I'll read it quickly. When a creature you can see moves into reach and you have a melee weapon you're wielding, you can use your reaction to expend one superiority die and make one attack against the creature using that weapon. If the attack hits, the superiority die is added to weapons damage roll. Now, I don't care so much about that. Although, you know, getting more damage is obviously good. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. Mostly, though, like I said, we are now attacking on someone else's turn, allowing us to once again sneak attack. Because we're only limited to one sneak attack per turn, not per round. Very important distinction there. And, uh, you know, so now if someone attacks us and misses, we can use our reaction to repost them. If someone comes running up to us, we can use our reaction and brace them. It gives us another option. So, I like that a lot. As far as our third choice, I probably like precision attack the most. Especially if I only have one attack around, if I only took three levels of Battle Master. I really want to make sure I'm hitting with that attack, right? So being able to use a precision attack to turn a potential miss into a potential hit, suddenly we're going to get in that damage again, right? However, just in case you didn't want precision attack, or maybe you wanted, say, seven levels of Battle Master, and you get a couple more maneuver choices, uh, trip is worth considering. If they're, you know, if the rest of your party is going to be ranged, trip is going to be a bad idea. But if you've got a very melee-focused party, tripping them is going to give them the advantage on their attack rolls against that target. That can be pretty good. Goading attack one problem we might have is that we're only triggering a post if people are attacking us. The dungeon master could just decide, oh, well, they saw you repost them, and now they're just going to start attacking everybody else that's up in melee instead of you. That can be an issue. Going attack can allow them to have to refocus on us because now they're attacking everybody else with disadvantage. Rally. Not my favorite choice usually, but it does give us a bit more like um, utility in combat and it allows us to help some allies out. And bait and switch can do kind of the same thing, allowing us to switch places with someone. Again, that can be rather useful. They have to be a willing target though, remember that. So you're not gonna be switching with the enemy. And uh, if you want to make a grappler, then grappling attack is definitely worth considering. Expertise on grappling can be pretty good. So. I think those are all options, but I do want to make it clear. I do feel like precision attack is 
better than those other options we've just mentioned, right? So my three are probably going to be Repost, Brace, Precision Attack. Uh, well, four, obviously we get another ability score increase, five, we get extra attack, six, we get another ability score increase if we go that high, and seven, we get Know Your Enemy, and as I've mentioned, a couple more choices for, for uh, maneuvers and another superiority guide. Know Your Enemy, I don't really like at all, it's basically out of combat, and, you know, rather circumstantial, so who cares, we're just going to skip that and move to the good stuff. Rogue. <laughs> So at level one, we already get Expertise. Expertise is awesome, we all know that. We get Thieves Cant. Uh, I mean, it's probably more useful than Know Your Enemy, but not by much. <laughs> uh, we also start Sneak Attack. Only one die six, we started slow, but you know, every two more levels we add to this, going up by another die. Level two, we get Cunning Action. Cunning Action is great on fighters, because fighters usually do not have like a really reliable, consistent use for their bonus actions. They don't really have one built in. Yeah, you can second wind and stuff like that, but you've only got the one second wind usually. If you're charging on a short rest, but you know, how often do you think that you're about to die in combat? Hopefully, no more than once per short rest. So either way, you know, it's nice to have something like a cunning action. And cunning action is really just like one of the premier things you can have as a bonus action, honestly. It's very flexible, gives you a lot of options. It's very, very strong. So, awesome stuff there. Level three, we're going to get our swashbuckle features. We'll talk about more of those specifically in a moment. Four, of course, another ability score increase. Five, uncanny dodge, very nice. Six, more expertise, also very nice. Seven, evasion, also very nice. Uh, Basically, we'll skip to 11. We'll, we'll skip over ability score increases and stuff. You guys know the basics by now, obviously. 11, we get Reliable Talent. This is an awesome ability. But bear in mind that if we have like five-ish fighter levels at this point, we're getting this pretty late, right? 14, Blind Sense, if our campaign goes that high. 15, Slippery Mind. Again, if we get that high. Um, swashbuckler abilities specifically. At level three, we get fancy footwork. If you make a melee attack against a target, it can't make opportunity attacks against you for the rest of the round. This isn't bad. You might want to like, you know, attack somebody and move away. Now granted, you could have disengaged with your cunning action, but maybe you want to use your cunning action for something else. Either way, that target can't attack you now. Very good. Especially because it's not costing us anything. We're not having to use our die or something. We're not giving up something with it, you know. It's just there. Uh, we also get Rackish Audacity. Now, we already mentioned this, but it's going to give you our Charisma bonus added to our initiative score, and we don't need an ally within five feet of us in order to sneak attack. Excellent stuff. Level nine, we get Panache. Uh, I'm just going to read this ability out of the book because it's too long for me to try to quote it or remember it from memory. Um, I want to point out, I really want to like Panache, but it has some big drawbacks. <laughs> we'll talk about those in a moment. So, level nine. Your charm becomes extraordinarily, extraordinarily, there we go, beguiling. As an action, you can make a charisma persuasion check contested by the creature's wisdom insight check. The creature must be able to hear you, and the two of you must share a language. So already we've got a few problems. We need to be able to share a language with the creature. That does limit what we can use it on. Uh, it gets a check to avoid it. That might not be bad. A lot of creatures tend to have poor wisdom checks, but unfortunately the things that have the worst wisdom checks tend to be things like beasts, which we probably don't share a language with. It also requires our action. This might not be bad, but that is a lot to give up. However, if you succeed on the check and the creature is hostile to you, it has disadvantage on attack rolls against targets other than you and can't make opportunity attacks against targets other than you. This effect lasts for one minute or until your companions attack the target or attack it with a spell or until you or the target are more than 60 feet apart. There's also a bunch of stuff that you can charm something out of combat. Not too worried about that right now. The main thing here is that we've already talked about how Repost requires something to attack us and miss. But if they're just not attacking us, they're attacking our allies, we're not reposting. This can be a way to try to get them to refocus back on us. But like I've said, 
there are some problems. We, we also have an additional problem that just came out in this paragraph. If our allies damage it or affect it with a spell, the effect ends. Which really means you need to be able to goad this thing into attacking you while no one else does anything to it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've been in groups where people have literally used this exact ability and then the next guy in combat decides to attack that creature. And the rogue's like, dude, what are you doing? I just used panache on him. And it's like, yeah, but like he just attacked me. It's like, yeah, but now he's got disadvantage if he tries to attack you again. It's like, oh, yeah, but like he's like half dead. He's attacking me. Like I'm just going to hit him. Like, Ugh. Okay, well, basically the rogue just wasted his turn then. Is that what you're telling us? Like, oh, yeah, sorry, man. But you know, he's half dead. I'm just trying to finish off. Be more efficient, you know? That's what, that's what we call teamwork. <laughs> ah, glorious. Uh, some of the groups I've been in have been pretty remarkable. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Elegant Maneuver, 13. Starting at 13th level, you can use a bonus action on your turn to gain advantage on the next dexterity, acrobatics, or strength athletics check you make during the same turn. So, again, if you want to be like a grappler or something, this can be pretty good because you're probably going dex and don't have a super high strength on this type of character even though you're a fighter and so being able to give you some advantage is really good but it's even better in my opinion out of combat because you know the wizard didn't bother to take fly because he needed fireball lightning bolt and melset uh money meteors i think that's the third one not acid arrow whatever the point is he just needed lots and lots of damage spells and you know i mean who needs fly for anything? So now you have to jump over the chasm and uh, realize the wizard didn't bother a feather fall either. So hopefully he can make the jump. But either way, uh, you probably can because you can just give yourself advantage on that check and you'll probably be good. You may need a new wizard though. Uh, 17th level, Master Duelist. Beginning at 17th level, your mastery of the blade lets you turn failure into success in combat. If you miss with an attack roll, you can roll again with advantage. Once you do so, you can't use this feature again until you finish a short or a long rest. This is actually a pretty awesome ability. The only problem is that if we have three levels of fighter, it's going to be our new capstone. And if we have five levels of fighter, we're not going to be able to get this ability at all. But, you know, it is extremely high level. So, you know, being able to turn misses into it, uh, just re-rolling again with advantage, no less. Very nice stuff. So, like I said, I, one thing I do like about this build in general is that really, at its base level, you can take your three levels of, of Battle Master, you can take your three levels of Swashbuckler, and by level six, the build is basically online. Like, obviously, adding more levels of Rogue for more Sneak Attack is just going to make it better. Adding things like Evasion and stuff is just going to make it better. Adding second attack is going to make it better. But all that stuff will come in time. This isn't a build where you need 10 or 12 or 13 levels before it really starts to come into its own. Really, three levels of fighter, three levels of rogue, and you're good to go. And just to point it out, those three levels of rogue is two dice six sneak attack damage. A pure six level rogue at that point is only a three dice six, right? He's only one die ahead of you. And really you're going to be able to sneak attack on you know enemies coming into combat with you somebody attacking you and missing you can sneak attack so you're going to be doing quite a bit more damage at least in my opinion um so anyways that's the basics however there are some feat choices you can make to really enhance this build and make it even better the first one i want to mention is sentinel uh sentinel is really the the strong option to what you do when the dungeon master decides just not to have enemies attack you. So we've already mentioned the issue of, you know, you require guys to attack you and miss in order to repost them. Sentinel gives you a way to attack whenever they're attacking somebody other than you, as long as that allies within five feet. And now you attack using your reaction and sneak attack them. And the best part is, it's not using superiority die. So this can just be triggering every round for as long as combats keep going, even if you haven't had a chance to rest and recharge your die. It's just, you know, it's the gift that just keeps on giving. 
So Sentinel is absolutely great on this build. But there are some other ones that I like a lot as well. So let's throw those out as well. I've already mentioned Alert, but Alert is just a really strong feat in general. And one additional thing that I like about Alert is you can attack people that can't that you can't normally even see, and instead of having disadvantage, you attack regularly. That's not usually a big deal, but if you have disadvantage on a rogue, you literally just cannot sneak attack. So at least in this case, if you are going to attack by somebody who's invisible, you're attacking normally, and you can probably still sneak attack, because you don't need an ally within five feet either on this build. So alert, plus five to your initiative, and occasionally saving your sneak attack that you might have lost otherwise. Um, like I said, you know, you're going to be a very, very fast character in combat, especially if you get high enough to, like, you know, like, max your dex, you've got alert, you've got a, let's say, a plus two bonus from charisma, but maybe a plus three even, depending on how you build your character. Uh, you know, that's a lot. Um, at higher levels, you can even get things like Goliath Tell, which are pretty sweet if you're, you know, using it in certain ways. Uh, that can be pretty handy as well. But yeah, you're going to be very fast and, uh, go first in combat a lot. So good thing you don't need an ally close. Lucky, always great as well. Um, there's nothing worse than like failing a key saving throw or something like that. Being able to reroll the attack is great. The dungeon master crits you with a fire giant and you're like, oh no, oh, this is gonna hurt. And then you're like, wait, I have lucky. I'm gonna force you to reroll that attack roll. And, uh, Granted, he could crit you again, that would be bad, but probably not going to happen. And it's pretty strong. So those are strong choices. The mobile feat. You've already got a character who's very mobile in combat. This just allows you to like take it to that next level. And I like this a lot on this kind of build. Uh, finally, a little more niche, but still very strong. You've got the Elven Accuracy feat. You're already going with Dex. Not strength, so, you know, strength doesn't really help you if you're using open accuracy. Um, so that's pretty good. You can get the point of dexterity as well. It does require you to be elf or half elf or some, some, some something elven. <laughs> uh, elven, elvish, whatever it is. Um, and it kind of requires you to be able to give yourself an advantage quite often, which, granted, some Battlemaster maneuvers can do. The problem is we're you know, limited on what maneuvers we can take unless we're going higher Battlemaster. But, you know, something like a trip attack and then action surging and then, you know, attacking. It's not bad. I really like Elven Accuracy more, though, if I'm going with someone like, say, Samurai. Because Samurai has Fighting Spirit and you can give yourself advantage on all your attacks that round. And, of course, if you have advantage, you're guaranteed to be able to sneak attack as well. So, I think that if you're going something other than Battlemaster, Samurai makes a very, very compelling uh, choice. And I really like Elvish Accuracy with that. But, we're not going Samurai in this video. So, I figured I'd mention it. But, as much as I love Elven Accuracy, I kind of put it lower than the other ones that we're mentioning for this specific build. Uh, Sentinel would probably be my number one choice, honestly, here. And then just every round, I attack, I sneak attack. Somebody attacks me, hopefully they miss, I sneak attack. Oh, they attack the Paladin? Ah, Sentinel, I sneak attack. <laughs> oh, somebody just came charging at me? Brace, I sneak attack. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. You can, like, almost guaranteed you're attacking at least twice per turn, or, or sorry, twice per round, with sneak attacks, right? Instead of once per round. So, you know, pretty good stuff. Um, final thoughts. I do like one thing about this build as well that's definitely worth mentioning is that you can start fighter or rogue. Sometimes when we go with fighter multi-classes, we're wanting the heavy armor. Probably not using that if I want to be stealthy and sneaky, which I really do, right? I'm going to be going dexterity. So, we don't need to go fighter for the heavy armor choices. Not necessary. Another thing I might want about fighter usually would be constitution saving throws so I have proficiency on my concentration saving throws. Again, if we went arcane trickster, that might be consideration here, right? Just, you know, mentioning that. 
But because we're not going Arcane Trickster in this build, again, I don't really need those Concentration saving throws. I might prefer to have the Rogue saving throws instead, right? Especially Dexterity. On the other hand, um, I'm already going to have a high Dexterity. Maybe I do want Constitution because I'm like, eh, my Constitution is probably going to be a little lower because I might want some Charisma in there as well. Now I'll have a decent Con save. And because I have so much Dexterity, I'll have a decent Dex save on top of that. So you could go either way, I think, right? But I do like that you have some flexibility there. Starting Rogue, of course, will give us the extra skill. That's not a bad thing either. And, um, you know, get that sneak attack, die in early, <laughs> build it up to like level three or so, then go Fighter. I like Fighter first if I want to go high enough for extra attack. But I don't mind Rogue first if I'm only taking the three levels of Fighter. So, you know, you can play it either way. A starting fighter works well either way, though. But I don't think it's, you know, required like it almost is in some of the other builds we've talked about, right? Like if you're taking one level fighter and combining it with Withered, that fighter level needs to be at level one. I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just a non-negotiable. You get the heavy armor, you get the constitution saving throws. That's why you wanted fighter with all those other levels taken in Withered, right? So, you know, start fighter in that case. This one, you know, you can do it either way. So anyways, those are my thoughts on this particular uh, combination of subclasses. I really, really like this combination. I think it's very fun. I love the idea of just like doing tons of sneak attacks. Um, you know, let's face it, sometimes just rolling a whole handful of dice uh, is really fun. That's one of the things that brings us back to D&D, you know? That's one of the things that D&D uh, offers when you're sitting at a gaming table that things like Roll20 don't have as well. And I'm not trying to dunk on Roll20 here, right? Like online D&D has really made D&D be able to spread and become very accessible. And it means that, you know, especially in times like these where you may not have been able to get together with your friends to do, you know, certain restrictions depending on where you may have lived, um, you know, it's still allowed those kind of things to, to thrive and, and to continue and to even spread further. So, you know, I'm not trying to take a shot at that. But I think we all know there's just something magical about being there in a room with your friends. You all order pizza or something and you just grab those handful of dice, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just kind of magical. So anyways, um, those are my thoughts on this. Uh, I'm going to be continuing, of course, with the uh, fighter build for the next couple of videos and course continuing with the multi-class and tier list but my brother gave me a great idea for a video I was talking to him earlier today because it was his birthday and he said you know like for like your 1,000 subscriber special you should just do like kind of you know like your history with D&D &D. and we were talking about it and I realized this year is going to be 40 years that I started playing D&D because &D. I started when I was 12 almost 13 I'm 52 Getting, I'm still like six months away from 53, but I was like, man, that would be a great idea. It's been almost 40 years of D&D, &D and you know, played a lot of additions through the years, seen a lot of changes to the game. I didn't play 40 years straight or anything like that. There was like, you know, big breaks in between and stuff where, you know, I didn't play at all for a while, or played other games like Shadowrun or Vampire the Masquerade or Exalted or you know, whatever else is on on the shelves here. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay got a bunch of that. You know, but, you know, here we are 40 years later almost and still talk about D&D, &D, still playing D&D &D, and still enjoying D&D, &D, right? So I think that'd be a cool idea for a video and uh, I'll try to have a couple cool stories and stuff and just sort of talk about like how I got interested and how I got involved, you know, sort of like some of the fun adventures that we might have had or whatever. And I think that'd be a cool video. So yeah, um, we're getting close to a thousand subs. So I think that'd be kind of like a cool 1,000 special, just sort of like 40 years of D&D, &D, my kind of journey through it, you know? So uh, looking forward to that. We're getting close. So anyways, those are my thoughts. Starting to lose my voice again. Uh, you can tell this was my second take because the voice is already pretty rough. Um, anyways, so get, that, that's everything I have. Thank you for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications. Most importantly, leave me your comments in the comment section. I look forward to reading them, and I'll see you next time. Bye.